Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? OK, great. Uh, sorry for the hold up. I thought we were starting like 15 minutes later. I was enjoying a great coffee somewhere. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, first of all, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, and I always like being at the university environments, and especially at the Swedish University. I feel it's very dynamic and it's nesting a lot in climate change, sustainability issues, and agriculture challenges that we're facing. As the IPCC report uh, just put out about a month ago emphasizes the importance of these topics. So I'm really feeling privileged to be here. Um, uh, as you have heard already, so I'm going to talk about this uh, rural development report that we just launched uh, actually uh, in June. Uh, the report itself is really huge. But there's an overview. You can download the whole report also on our website. You'll find the links at the end of my presentation. But our overview basically synthesizes all the findings uh, of this report, uh, creating opportunities for rural youth. And for the interested reader, that's also uh, a couple of copies are out there. It's also online. Anyway, so uh, I just want to start with a show of hands. So how many people here are below the age of 25? OK. That's it's not bad, OK. Thanks. <laughs> There's an age dispute discussion there. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Uh, it's great to see, actually, maybe not that many, but a critical mass of youth uh, around uh, in this room. Uh, why did I say 25? Because it's the United Nations definition of youth. Uh, it's basically between ages of 15 and 24. And for the purposes of this book, uh, we have to uh, basically we have stuck with that definition, acknowledging the fact that, of course, all around the world, youth is more and more kind of understood as a, as a construct, social construct, and depends, definition of which depends from country to country, from region to region, even like within uh, countries for indigenous communities versus non-indigenous. But for, uh, for the purpose of the report, because we are, we're doing a global analysis of youth, we had to come up with something that is comparable across the whole world. So we're sticking to that uh, definition of youth. And why youth? Uh, because youth basically, as you all know, is a time of transition. It's a time of transition that's marked by critical decisions that affect both the future of the individual and the society. And for this reason, societies have been always concerned uh, about youth in general. And why rural youth? Uh, here in the slide, you can see uh, that basically we have taken the uh, global population, and now we only took the, the people that are in the youth bracket, 15 to 24, and we merged that information together with population density data to understand where these people are living. Are they living in rural areas, very sparse population, semi-rural, peri-urban, or urban areas, globally comparable scale? Uh, scale. And now when we look at that, basically we see out of 1.2 uh, billion youth in the world, 780 million of them live in non-urban spaces in the world. And the acronyms here that you see basically APR, Asia Pacific Region, LAC Latin America and Caribbean, NAN North uh, Africa and Eastern Europe, uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, out of the 780 million uh, rural youth in the world today, uh, today meaning 2015 United Nations population data, here you see how it's projected to change uh, going towards 2050. And only in Sub-Saharan Africa, we see a staggering increase in, in the number of rural youth. And when we, these are my favorite graphs uh, from well, cartographs, uh, cartograms from the report. This is basically a map of the world where you see the, the surface areas of the countries inflated or deflated based on their share of rural youth in the whole world. From 2015 data, you see that basically a disproportionate amount of today's rural youth live in Asia. This is about like 65% of rural youth, China and India obviously uh, taking the majority of rural youth, accounting for the majority today. But when you switch to 2050, you see basically the area of Africa swelling significantly, while that of Asia Pacific region is uh, shrinking. So just to see it again, this basically tells us, okay, most of today's rural youth actually are, uh, might be living in APR, so that might define today's youth challenge. But when you look at the future's youth challenge, 2030, 2050, uh, that's mostly sub-Saharan Africa. And within these countries, obviously also in other countries, there are still a lot of rural youth, as you see, these are the share globally. 
where do they live in terms of the economic opportunities of these countries that they reside in, right? So then we took the, uh, we took the youth population again uh, and merged it together with, the, with their country's uh, gross national income, GDP, and their rural poverty rates. And as you see, the bubbles represent the millions of rural youth. And you see here basically the majority of the growth that we expect here in, uh, in rural youth population are in these countries on the, on the left side of the, the bubble graph with really high rural poverty rates. So that makes basically another case for caring about rural youth, looking into the future, trying to achieve SDGs and other development goals that we have. And what do these young people do, right? To be able to understand, okay, what do youth spend their time on? We had to have data uh, to be able to understand like their time use in terms of employment, training, schooling, what else they're doing with their time. So we put together data from 12 uh, countries, national representative data from 12 countries from all around the world. And then we looked at their time use, full-time equivalence, basically a way of looking at uh, youth time use, what do they work in, uh, what do they spend their time on. And uh, this basically comes from a data set uh, of about 800,000 individuals. And we also divided them into their, uh, the, the household types that they live in, because what youth do also partially depends on their household typology, right? You see here, the households could be doing subsistence farming, they could be doing specialized farming, they could be transitioning between farming and non-farm activities, or it could be fully non-farm transitioned households. And when we look at the time use of these rural youth of, the, of these 12 countries that we have, uh, basically, we see majority of the of the rural youth time spent uh, is spent on agriculture or uh, industries related to agriculture. Basically, uh, spanning from use and supply of inputs, uh, production of food, as well as packaging, processing, and retail of food. These colors are highlighted to highlight basically the the, the percentage of their time that is spent on the agri-food system. That this uh, range of food production that I just mentioned. So basically, this again makes rural youth an important cornerstone of our, of our policy that we should be keeping in mind to be able to uh, create a rural transformation towards SDGs. So we understood, okay, rural youth are at the, uh, at the center of, uh, for rural development for today, but especially in the future. And it depends, of course, uh, in terms of the, the, their weight in the country's population. But how do, we, how do we actually invest in rural youth so that we can build the foundations for their uh, productive inclusion in the rural transformation process? So we came up basically with these three different principles, three foundations for rural youth-centered development. It goes basically from productivity, because you want to make productive individuals, uh, to connectivity. Individuals want to be basically connected to the rest of the world, to the markets, to ideas, to uh, you know, images, holiday places, whatever you want, but people want to be connected. And unless they're connected, their productivity isn't going to give you actually much in terms of growth or synergies of knowledge development and science even. But at the end, also agency, right? Uh, especially rural youth, we have a whole section, uh, chapter in the Rural Development Report on rural youth participation in policies and societies. So uh, you know, in order to make sure that youth uh, are include, included in the rural transformation process, we also need to invest in uh, policies and processes to, to make sure that they have agency, they're basically in charge of their lives and then they, they feel empowered. So to be able to do that, uh, basically we have three key considerations, right? How do we create individuals that are productive, that are connected, and then that are in charge of their own lives? First of all, we have to understand the settings in which rural youth live. Because, as I mentioned kind of briefly at the beginning, so the countries that they live in, the rural spaces that they occupy, and their, their families, uh, their, their households, all shape their opportunities and their, op uh, their probabilities of grasping opportunities, whatever uh, opportunity that they see. So we need to understand the setting in which they live in. And uh, why youth, again, at the beginning of this report creation process two years ago, I was like, why do we care about youth? So I started reading up all these like, different uh, UN organizations, bilateral development organizations, NGOs, everybody's talking about youth. But you know, to understand, as a maybe systematic economist, let's say, I had to understand like, the constraints that actually set them apart from the rest of the population, 
So we can make a special case about rural youth. And it turns out that actually in some cases, the constraints that rural youth face are very different from the rest of the population, from the adults or from uh, you know, other parts of the society. So we need to understand their specific constraints and to the extent to which uh, that they're different from the rest of the population. And lastly, but not least, the dynamic of change. Um, we, we see today in the world unprecedented change of like climate change, you have digital technology, you have demographic transitions happening faster and faster. So the pace uh, of natural change, uh, the systemic change, is very fast today. So that also requires a new approach thinking about rural youth because our traditional ways of doing even education aren't really useful anymore uh, given this change. So we'll go through uh, briefly about these three steps and then I'll conclude with some of IFAD cases that we have uh, analyzed for this report. So the setting in which rural youth live, right? First of all, let's look at where they live. So we took again global rural youth, that's 780 million youth that I've just talked about. And then we looked at their country's uh, levels of rural transformation and structural transformation. The previous version of the Rural Development Report talked about rural transformation and the ways to make it inclusive of all. So the definition of rural transformation borrowed from that report is basically value added from agricultural sector in each country. And on the y-axis, you see the structural transformation, which is the share of non-agriculture in the country's GDP. So the more non-ag ha you have in your economy, the more structurally transformed you are. And then we basically mapped all the countries in our data set, the uh, developing countries, 85 developing countries, on this uh, country transformation typology. And now we see basically about 72% of today's rural youth live in countries with low levels of rural transformation. So that basically is already kind of telling us, okay, although actually 20%, I don't know which one is the pointer, but although 20% live on the high, high quadrant up above, about 70% are here in the low rural transformation, and the investments in that uh, country's rural youth would be fundamentally different from the countries in the high, high quadrant, right? Because they already have achieved high levels of structural and rural transformation, and then you first need to understand, okay, which youth, which country, and even within countries, what kind of uh, rural transformation has been achieved in the spaces that rural youth live. So let's first understand that, because countries' uh, capacity to invest in their youth, both fiscal, policy, and institutional, depends critically on, uh, on their economy, the national economy, right? Okay, and then, okay, given that you're living in a, let's say, low rural transformation country, but you might still have a rural space in that country, like physical space, where you have more or less transformation, more or less opportunities compared to the others. So how do we understand that? Again, so we took the whole world's global uh, rural youth and then combined that information with uh, using their location data, the georeferenced for everyone, basically their villages are georeferenced. We combined that data with, uh, with an indicator of agricultural potential, which is the Enhanced Vegetation Index, probably most of you are familiar with it, to represent their agricultural potential axis of the rural opportunity space, which is a concept borrowed from sociology literature. And on the y-axis, we put the commercialization potential that can be proxied in multiple different ways. Here we chose the population density, because basically if you have a very sparse population density in a place, Although you might create a lot of you know, ideas, products, you're not gonna have that much marketing and commercialization potential to grow your business, to create employment for others and things like that. So we took the population density of the places that they live in and divided it into ter terciles where you have low, medium, high population density areas representing the commercialization potential of the spaces that they live in. And I'm mapping all the whole world's youth on this surface, rural opportunity space, we find that 67% of rural youth live actually in very high agricultural potential areas, high enhanced vegetation index. This is like average of the previous three years to get rid of seasonality issues. Okay, so basically that means 67% of this youth actually live in places where they can actually produce agricultural products or related you know, livestock and um, ag-related uh, production. 
But it doesn't mean that you know, uh, their main constraint isn't, isn't related to agriculture, because only 24% only of the total are also in really highly commercialized areas, so they have the potential to create something, create businesses, and then grow their ideas. And all the rest find themselves in limited commercialization potential areas. And when you see the red circle, red, red uh, quadrant there on the lower left, the severe challenges, this is very interesting because when we d d dig down deeper in that, 4% of the rural, uh, rural youth in the world uh, li that live in the lowest agricultural potential, lowest commercialization potential, they tend to be concentrated in countries with highest rural and structural transformation. Basically, that tells us that like, there are pockets of poverty in these places that need specific type of interventions. They're not living majority in sub-Saharan Africa, this red 4%. So again, like trying to create a, a typology of thinking about rural youth, rural opportunity space becomes a very important tool for us to, to think about that. So we looked at uh, the countries that they live in, we looked at the rural spaces that they live in, at the end, households, right? Because you can have all the national space, rural opportunity that you can imagine, but if your household is a subsistence agriculture that has very limited amount of land, no access to credit, not much education and access to health and all that, then as rural youth, because we know that majority of youth live as dependents in other households. So depending on your households, participation in the economy and the society, rural youth will also have different opportunities and different probabilities of grasping the opportunities. So when we look at the, the rural youth in our data set, which was this 12 country data set of 800,000 individuals, you see majority of them live in, country, live in households that are transitioning between agriculture, subsistence agriculture, towards either specialized ag or non-ag livelihoods. So they find themselves in a dynamic, dy dynamic uh, space, let's say, in the household's transformation process. And with right investments, they can actually become the future's maybe uh, specialized farm household heads or non-farm household heads. So again, understanding the, the, the household typology is our third step of the typology, trying to think about rural youth. So the constraints, I mentioned the constraints earlier, why? Because as we all know, everybody, like not just youth, right, in some countries faces credit constraints, land constraints, and uh, access to finance or other types of productive resources. Do youth face specific constraints? First, basically comes into our minds is capacities and skills. Just by the nature of being young, being in this phase of transition from dependence to independence, um, basically youth obviously lack some skills that adults do have, right? And especially uh, these cognitive uh, skills that, for example, the schools provide, you know, calculating, memorizing, remembering, uh, understanding science and things like that. Maybe the normal education systems provide these skills, but the, the non-cognitive skills that come with experience, that come with interacting with others in farmers' groups, in banks, in credit organizations, with the government, these social-emotional skills are what they need. And it's very hard to expect, actually, from a 15, 16-year-old to have these skills. But there are ways to build it in, in the existing education system so we can have a faster, uh, let's say, transition from lack of these skills, social-emotional skills, to a position where they can use their cognitive skills combined with these uh, social-emotional skills to become productive individuals. Access to finance. So we looked at all the literature published, and we worked with experts, actually, in all these topics. We have worked with more than 20 experts all around the world in their own uh, themes, and then we asked them to focus on rural youth. So when we looked at all the evidence that's out there, access to finance, youth obviously also uh, have a specific constraint because you can't expect a bank to give a credit to an 18-year-old. Even, I don't have children, but you know, uh, people who have children, they have to sign off their children's uh, credit or loan uh, requests from the bank. Without that, you cannot expect, you know, if I were a bank, I wouldn't, right? Uh, 
But um, so access to finance still remains important. But in places where youth go through these like, education systems, they go through vocational training, they go through you know, all these entrepreneurship incubators and this and that, but they come out, there's no finance. So we can't actually expect all that investment, youth-specific investment, to give us some, uh, some benefits at the end in terms of rural transformation if they're lacking finance at the end. Access to land. This is also very critical. Uh, because one in three adults, actually, in sub-Saharan Africa, like through a meta-analysis this, uh, this is based on, one in three adults has access to land with a defined property right. When you look at youth, one in ten have access to land. When you look at rural young women, this is one in 20. So even if you, have, if you are interested in agriculture, if you cannot rent land, a lot of countries have rental, uh, land rental uh, markets not functioning. So, and you're not inheriting more land earlier, like in the past, because people are living longer, the parents, so they're not kind of giving over their land, which is actually good news, right? Because people are living longer lives, but then implications for youth is they don't have access to land. They, they don't inherit as they used to earlier in their lives anymore. Um, so access to land, then, is one of the youth-specific problems that needs to be addressed in investing in rural transformation. And gender norms. Uh, I couldn't not spend uh, some time on that because writing this report, it was very interesting for me actually to just keep coming back to the, to the demographic transition and the, the role young women play in speeding up the demographic transition so countries can reap a benefit of demographic dividend. And in a lot of countries, in developing countries, Young women are still constrained in terms of their mobility. There are safety concerns. If I want to get a wage job, if I live in a rural area in Uganda, and I want to go to semi-rural or peri-urban areas, commute, mobility safety issues are important constraints for young rural women, as well as their access to reproductive education and reproductive health services. Uh, that is something that IFAD does not invest, like you know, reproductive health and things like that things like that, but we, ha we made a really strong point in the report because it becomes, it becomes a central piece of demographic dividend for every country in the world. So looking at, this is basically looking at the demographic and health surveys from more than 30 countries, uh, trying to basically look at uh, women's ideal number of children. Uh, they're divided by rural towns, small cities, and main cities, and the color bars are all women and 15 to 24-year-old young women. Although you see younger women desire to have less children than older women in every region, um, in, every, uh, in every region you also see rural women wanting more children than urban women. Especially in sub-Saharan Africa, it's striking the fact that even in the main cities of sub-Saharan Africa, all women want more children than anywhere else in the world. So this is a really stereotypical representation, a very really striking representation of Africa's delayed demographic transition. Because that's what's kind of holding back the demographic dividend that Africa actually could reap if the birth rates come down. Basically, how can be achieved? How that can be achieved, I will mention later. But at the bottom lies the, the birth rates that haven't come down. That's the second stage of the dem demographic transition. First, the death rates come down, and then there's this period where people are dying later and later, and then a lot of like, youth cohort comes into the population. And as long as the birth rates don't come down, the countries cannot reap the demographic dividend, even if they invest uh, in their youth. Dynamic nature of change that I mentioned again, all these things, the constraints and their settings, they're changing like in, in, a, in a pace that we can't keep track anymore, right? So traditional ways of uh, teaching, educating, training, even for adults, aren't useful anymore. With this, like, especially the, the digital revolution, right? The nature of work has been changing significantly, and now we need more and more in-work in training, trying to develop our capacities to process huge amounts of data and information to keep uh, up with the pace of change. Climate change, I don't need to preach to the converted here. Climate change is changing significantly. The, the cognitive requirements that we we kind of teach children or youth at schools, right? So it changes the information environment significantly, and being able to deal with this like uncertainty and 
changing future climates for which they need to plan, also uh, youth need to have education that kind of capacitates them to deal with the, with the new information environment. So just a couple of examples of IFAD investments that have been studied and proven to make some difference uh, on, the, on the ground. So this is a, a Nepal uh, project, post-conflict uh, capacitation of rural youth in terms of their vocational technical skills. But we also looked at all the literature, including meta-analyses and like, experts looking at vocational training. And now we see that a lot of vocational training doesn't actually work. Why? Because in countries where you have a missing rural transformation, missing opportunities for everybody, you could train youth as much as you want in a confectionery or whatever, even like IT processing coding. If the rural transformation, the, the opportunity for everyone isn't there, the connectivity, roads, uh, or infrastructure, both digital and physical infrastructure, that vocational training isn't going to really work. So in this project, basically, uh, there is a strong component of trying to teach them non-cognitive skills, these socio-emotional skills, because they're proven to be more and more important for, uh, for livelihoods and employment opportunities at the end. And they also partner with private sector. Somebody made a really important point at the end of the previous session. Without involving pr private sector, again, we're not going to go that far, actually, in investing in our rural youth. So uh, there are strong partnerships with private sector, and there's incubators where youth are, okay, uh, where youth are like closely connected to adults in the same industry. You know, if you're, let's say, developing some, uh, I don't know, some app for some new uh, computer game or whatever it is, this is ag, but this is just a random example. You will be always partnered with a, with an adult that kind of knows how to deal with the business environment, how to deal with the banks, how to deal with the uh, with marketing and managing supply and demand. So there's continuous support from the adults in the same, same industry. So that, that turns out that it actually helps uh, combining vocational and technical training with the broader development interventions like that. And uh, this is an example from El Salvador. Uh, IFAD has actually uh, supported the creation of the first uh, National Youth Assembly. There are about 3,000 youth uh, in, the, in the whole uh, as assembly that actually actively participates in policy making, not just about youth policies, because we see that in a lot of countries, um, youth are just like confined to okay, sports and maybe some IT and you know, only youth issues. But what's very important in these types of uh, national assemblies is that they participate in agricultural policy, education policy, health policy, nutrition policy, which is also very important. So they feel empowered, and then they can see themselves contributing to the society, so that's part of the agency creation as well. And uh, the triple challenge, the triple burden of young rural women that I've mentioned, right? So you're young, you're a female, so you're constrained in terms of your mobility or access to different resources by social norms, and um, you're, what did I say? Rural, yeah, rural we already talked about. So to be able to address these like triple burden, IFAD and some other development partners have been applying uh, a, a method called GALS, Gender Action Learning System, where basically the change, the social change, social norms uh, are being tried to change by including the, the larger societies. So they're called the gatekeepers of uh, young rural women, for example, in the Northeast and Middle, uh, Middle East and North Africa. Um, that basically the, the norms about female, young female mobility are set by the adults, of course, and mostly male adults in a lot of countries. So these kinds of interventions include the whole society and ho household methodology also as part of that, where you sit down, including the youth, try to make a trajectory of your development for the next five years, for the next 10 years, where do you see yourself, how do you get there, and then there's a continuous feedback at the community level as well. And uh, we can observe that social norms are already changing and improving and trying to appreciate young rural women's contribution to the economy and the society. So basically, just uh, the bottom line, the three main uh, messages from the report is that basically you cannot just expect to invest in only youth-specific training program, let's say. You're putting all the youth in one room, uh, coding, marathon, hackathon, whatever it is, 
um, if it's not in integrated into the broader rural development policy. So it has to be integrated in the broader rural development policy. And it's very important to find the right balance between rural transformation policy in general, trying to create opportunities for everybody, but that's also youth inclusive, and, uh, and the other policies and investments that are really youth specific. So that also, the, the balance will be determined about, uh, determined based on the national country setting, the, the, the transformation stage of the country, as well as the rural opportunity space within countries where youth live, and the, the constraints that they might face from their households engagement in the economy. And the last one, basically the motto of the whole report in general, that we need to uh, address the three foundations of rural youth development, productivity, connectivity, and agency, right? So just to conclude with two slides, where we basically try to uh, kind of visualize, okay, how do we design uh, youth specific policies? There are much more details in the report, but it's just conceptually I'm going to mention here. So in, in a setting where you have a low level of rural opportunity, uh, you, you see that the weight of the policies and investments in rural transformation that are also youth inclusive should be much higher than youth specific narrowly targeted projects and investments. And in places where you have higher level of rural opportunity, where you have already maybe enough infrastructure, both digital and physical, as well as production value chains and everything a bit in more, uh, more in place, then you can actually afford to focus more in youth-specific investments and policies to create the youth-centered rural transformation. I'm going to skip this last one. There were some examples of policies. And thank you all for listening, and happy to get your questions. Thanks.